he will be missed. A big brother that I can reach out to. I'm going to miss my big brother. This is Your World Today with Issa Suarez and Cyril Vanier. A very warm welcome to the show. Our top story this hour, the rush to contain the Wuhan coronavirus. 60 cases have now been confirmed outside mainland China, reaching, really, as you can see in that map, far away is North America, Australia and France. But it's the number of cases inside China that is exploding. 82 people there have now died and more than 2,800 others have been infected. So these 15 cities here with a combined population of almost 60 million remain under full or Stop partial it. lockdown as we speak. And China says it will spend almost $9 billion to fight the disease, and its premier visited the epicenter of the outbreak on Monday, urging health workers in Wuhan to protect themselves as they treat patients. But what's really setting off alarms is what China's health minister announced over the weekend, that people can spread the virus even if they don't show symptoms. Some other health experts say it's too soon to know whether that's true and foreigners in Wuhan don't want to find out to wait to find out as the outbreak intensifies they're trying to get out and trying to get out fast David Culver has a story this is nope. the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak Priscilla Dickey and her eight-year-old daughter Hermione are preparing for a flight back to the U.S. I sign up and then I get the call at four and now I'm trying to scramble my way to get into a car at two in the morning to get to the to the airport. Tomorrow. But like at least six or five or six. The pair live in Wuhan, China. The city's been on lockdown since Thursday. No one is to leave without special permission. The U.S. State Department arranged a charter flight for American diplomats and a select number of civilians, including Priscilla and Hermione. Scheduled to depart Wuhan on Tuesday. Destination, California. Priscilla's reason? Well, sitting right next to her. Just just her. Um, just having her with me. Um, because uh, if I was by myself, I'd probably be like, whatever. I'm just going to ride it out. They're leaving as Chinese military medical teams are arriving. The personnel brought with them a batch of much-needed supplies, including 10,000 protective suits. But the demand for face masks and other protective gear far outnumbers the current supply which is why assembly lines were ordered to power back up during the holiday. Employees working overtime. This as a swarm of construction crews work to build not one, but two hospitals within two weeks time. They will be dedicated to treating those infected with the virus. Meantime, on the eve of their evacuation from Wuhan, Priscilla and Hermione know the long flight back to the US is only the beginning of a long journey. What I've heard is that they're going to quarantine us for anywhere from 72 hours to 14 days. Um, 14 days? Mm -hmm. And then after that, we are free to travel back to our destinations. Part of the reason for that quarantine is new concern raised by health officials here in China that the virus might be transmittable for up to 14 days after exposure, even if the carrier is not yet showing symptoms. David Corver, CNN, Beijing. Well, worries about the virus hit U.S. equity markets hard on Monday, sending all three major indices to their biggest single-day drop in months. Let's have a look at the numbers, if we can bring it up. There you see the Dow Jones Industrial plummeting more than 450 points, uh, 1.5%, wiping out this year's gain. The S&P 500 was almost off 1.6% there, and the Nasdaq sent even more, almost uh, 1.9% or 175 points, and that's important because uh, they worry that it could uh, fears of a global pandemic could have an impact on China's economic growth, depending, of course, on its duration, depending on the severity. Hence, why we're seeing markets uh, really uh, on, in the red uh, today, given what's happening out of China. Well, Stephen Zhang is live at CNN Beijing for more. Stephen, if, if I may, let's start with the containment. Uh, how are authorities managing the containment in China, from, from what you understand? 
Well, Isa, their number one strategy right now is still cutting off all possible and potential routes of transmission, which is why, as you mentioned, they're, they're placing the entire province, 60 million people, under a virtual lockdown. And elsewhere in this country, you're also seeing authorities announcing and enforcing increasingly strict uh, quarantine rules, uh, as well as other travel restrictions. Now, uh, this is understandable, as uh, you probably remember on Sunday, the mayor of Wuhan actually telling the country about 5 million people left the city before the authorities placed the city under a lockdown. So these are 5 million potential sources of infections and transmission, quite a massive number. Now, uh, the other thing, of course, is uh, to, uh, to, to contain this virus. The authorities have announced uh, the extension of this, this week-long national holiday of the Lunar New Year holiday by another three days while other local governments have announced even a further delays of the reopening of schools and businesses. Isa? Stephen, how are the Chinese reacting to this? Because there's the number of deaths, there's the disruption to the travel, there's how the government has or hasn't handled this, um, the number of people who are infected. I mean, what's the mood after all that? That's right. Increasingly, especially online, you are seeing a lot of frustration and mm. even anger. But at this uh, juncture, they're still training most of their fire towards local officials, especially the mayor of Wuhan and the governor of the Hubei province. A lot of uh, cause for uh, for them to uh, to be sacked even. But as if now, we don't see any evidence of that happening. But interestingly, though, a lot of people are thinking, uh, a lot of analysts are saying this is increasingly a problem for the country's top leader, President Xi Jinping, of course, and some even calling this as a Katrina moment. Now, you mentioned the country's number two leader, Premier Li Keqiang, actually was the one who went to Wuhan on Monday, uh, visiting medical staff, uh, ordinary people, and construction workers of new medical facilities. This is interesting because for, uh, for somebody like Mr. Xi, who is so omnipresent and dominant in the country's political landscape, he has taken somewhat of a, a backseat, if you will, in this. Now, some, of course, saying this is uh, his strategy of uh, having both ways, taking credit if things go well and improve, but not taking the blame if they don't. Cyril? Uh, Stephen Zhang reporting live from Beijing. Thank you very much for the update. Now, South Korea has also confirmed its fourth case of coronavirus after a 55-year-old man who visited Wuhan became the latest to test positive. Our Paula Hancocks has more now from Seoul. Jesus. Another case has been confirmed here in South Korea of coronavirus as the government has decided to raise the alert level. So it's at the second highest level now. And what this means is that the government steps in and takes control of the situation as opposed to the CDC. It also means an emergency task force will be set up. Now, where we are here is the National Medical Center in Seoul. And this is the area that the government has decided will be the main hospital that will take in any potential patients. There's one patient uh, who has the virus has already been looked after in the building behind us and you can see through uh, the doors that uh, many of the medical staff are wearing hazmat suits they don't want to take any risks and what we're also uh, seeing is that they're trying to figure out how they can move many of the other patients uh, that don't have the virus but that are sick to different uh, hospitals around Seoul that they they can free up beds as they are anticipating that they may need them in the future now behind me you can see a tent here that they're, they're making sure that anyone coming in uh, uh, with fears and symptoms that they may have this virus and not going through the regular channels and not mingling with the rest of the hospital. Now, this is the sort of thing that we are seeing around the world as these cases are increasing around the world. Here in South Korea as well, there are uh, indications that they are going to try and evacuate uh, their citizens out of the Wuhan area uh, in, uh, in China. We know that the United States is doing that. On Tuesday, they'll have a charter flight which will take out about three dozen uh, diplomats and their families. The, uh, the consulate in the area has been shut down as well. Uh, we understand also that Japan is looking to do this and try and evacuate uh, their, their citizens. Australia saying they have around 100 young Australians. They're trying to figure out how to get them out as well. So uh, this really is a case of uh, the, the numbers slowly but steadily uh, increasing in the, uh, the amount of patients around the world and countries looking very seriously at how they can take their citizens out of the uh, worst effect areas in China. Paula Hancock's CNN Seoul. So what kind of symptoms does a novel coronavirus cause? Well, they can be mild, such as a headache or even a cough, 
or even a bit more severe, like the flu. But in some patients, they can be as severe as pneumonia, breathing trouble, or even sepsis. And in the extreme cases, as we've seen it, it can be deadly. You can read more about it on CNN.com. There's a lot to learn there about this on our website. We have more from David Culver, our correspondent on the ground in Beijing. Joining us now is Dr. Anthony Fauci. He is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Sir, the first question to you is because the, the death toll keeps rising every day, especially in the most impacted area uh, in, in Wuhan, and the number of people who are estimated to be infected also keeps rising, how do we know if the current measures put in place to contain this are actually working? Well, certainly in China, in the Wuhan city and around that area, it is really a, a very serious and difficult situation. Obviously, uh, it is not yet well contained. The Chinese are doing some rather dramatic things. I mean, the idea of shutting down several cities for a total of 35 million people is an unprecedented mm. attempt to have a curtailment of an outbreak. So I suspect, in fact, I'm fairly certain that as the days go by, you're going to see an even greater and sharper increase in the number of cases, which will be almost certainly accompanied by an increase in the number of deaths. So we're in an evolving situation there where we have sustained transmission from person to person. Oh my that has God. to be interrupted or this can get out of control even more than it is. Oh, my God. When you say this has to be interrupted, Dr. Fauci, what do you mean by that? Well, when you say sustained transmission, that means one person affects another and another and yeah. another. And the way you measure the trajectory of an outbreak is what's called an r ought or an r zero. In other words, how many individuals does one index person infect? If one person infects only one person, then it's a rather slow outbreak. If you infect two to three to four, it becomes a more ominous outbreak. If you infect 10, more aggressive. 12, it becomes a catastrophe. More when aggressive. Less than one, by just natural evolution, the epidemic will essentially burn out. Right. Right now. Where does this virus rank on that scale? Right now, the RO is, is felt to be somewhere between 1.5 and 3 which is really a, you know, higher than you would like it to be at all. You'd like it to be less than one. And when I say get it under control, I mean getting that interruption of person to person so that individuals either don't infect on a one-to-one -one basis or no one at all. And that's gonna take some serious public health mitigation uh, activities. Yeah, and we heard from Chinese authorities, they also said, Dr. Fauci, that, uh, that the virus can spread before any symptoms actually appear. Does My that God. make it even more difficult for authorities to try and contain this? Uh, I have to say, if that is the case, and I want to tell you why I say if, if that's the case, that would be a game changer because that would make it very difficult to do screening of individuals if you're spreading infection without having any symptoms. Oh my to God. To be honest with you, I would really like to see that data firsthand at the granular level, which makes them come to that conclusion. Because that was said by the health minister in a press briefing. And I would really like to get people who are epidemiologists who can take a look at how that data was accumulated. Epidemiologists. Because it could be that it either doesn't occur or it occurs at a very, very low level. Right. Certainly, historically, asymptomatic infections have never driven epidemics of respiratory infections. Right. Uh, one more thing. Since so many of our viewers are business travelers and um, frequent travelers in general, what do they need to know? Let's just remind everybody out there what they need to know and what precautions they can take. Well, you know, the CDC has uh, really elevated for, the, for people in the United States their travel alert, hey, which means only hey, nice, essential travel should go to the area in Wuhan. Only essential travel. Dr. Fauci, before you go, can I ask you if there's anything we can learn from the SARS outbreak that may help uh, to deal with, with, with this coronavirus? 
Oh, absolutely. That's an excellent question. The SARS outbreak was also caused by a coronavirus. And the things that we learned from the SARS outbreak, that if you do very aggressive identification, isolation, and contact tracing, you can actually put an end to the outbreak the way the SARS outbreak was ultimately successfully controlled. We would have been doing it much more quickly if the Chinese had been a bit more transparent in 2002 when the outbreak first occurred. We didn't get the opportunity to jump all over it because we, we missed a couple of months worth that wasn't really being very transparent. They're much better now. They clearly are giving information in a much more regular manner. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks thank for you, all your information. Thanks. Good to be with you. Still to come right here on the show, the Trump administration's long-delayed Middle East peace plan. They're set to unveil it on Tuesday, but only one side is welcoming it. And the death of basketball legend Kobe Bryant sent shockwaves around the world. Fans in Los Angeles are grieving. Sad. You've heard it in the news. It's happening right. You know, you never realize how much of a icon a mentor that a good sports athlete has up onto a little child just like this right here. And Donald Trump really and truly deserves two thumbs up because he was one of the first ones that started bringing it out to the attention of the world about these athletes that wanted to disrespect our allegiance during the time that they was playing our national anthem. It was Donald Trump that said that what these athletes are doing is not only inappropriate, it's not only un-American, but it puts out a wrong signal to a little youngster, just like this right here, that's wearing this shirt, 95, or, or he should have a shirt, 24, but uh, just like this little youngster right here, uh, that once you put out the wrong signal and plant a seed in a little individual's head like that, the next thing you know, he'll get to thinking that it's cool or that it's acceptable or that it's all right to get out here and disrespect our national anthem and disrespect our American flag as being an American citizen. You know, I talked to somebody just the other day that won't even watch national football pertaining to the Super Bowl that's coming up, primarily because of all the disrespect and inconsiderateness that went on in the league that has stained the league probably for now on out. Anybody that's under a national spotlight that conducts themselves in that type of form should be looked upon as either being sick or should be looked upon in a treasonous type form. And I realize that they claim that they was using a good cause for doing what they was doing. But you can take something too far pertaining to using their limelight to display a cause 
in the wrong format and in the wrong way. At the wrong time. At the wrong time. I mean, to get out on national TV and basically take your nose and snarl it up to the American government for whatever reason is not appropriate because you didn't see people doing that in the NASCAR circuit. So just to give you an indication about the basketball player, Toby, who recently just passed away, it has a profound effect upon to children. Because in children's eyes, Toby was a hero. He was a mascot. He was a symbol. He was their hero, their Superman. He was their mentor that they looked up to. And in some incidences, they would probably have actually been willing to have died for him because they loved him so dearly. So, as erratical as Donald Trump has behaved in doing some of the things that he has done, in which I'm not trying to, to uh, justify in what he done with the Ukrainians was right, because that's a completely different story, once more, on a completely different level, on a completely different day. But what Donald Trump done by bringing that up to the American people and the world was appropriate in the fullest form. In the fullest form. Because without our little guys, and without our little rascals, without our little girls, without our youngsters, we don't have a future. Please, pray for our future. Please, pray for our children. Thank you. Millions more. We've got to learn to take care of each other. As we continue to remember Kobe Bryant, we want to take you to these life pictures outside the Staples Center in Los Angeles. That's where the Lakers play their games. And it's become a memorial as the city and people around the world mourn the death of this basketball legend that is Kobe Bryant, as well as his 13-year-old daughter and the seven others who died in a helicopter crash along with them. Flags in Los Angeles are flying at half staff by order of the May. You're looking at live images there from Los Angeles. It's 21 minutes past three in the afternoon. And these uh, really tributes everywhere, from coming from all parts of the world. There's a look at how Brian is being honored, in fact, in Tokyo. His parents named him after Kobe Beef. That's popular in Japan and right across the world. Italy, where Brian grew up, will mourn him for an entire week. The president of Italy's Basketball Federation calls it a small gesture, but one that is heartfelt and is deserved. The recovery teams have now removed the bodies of three of the nine victims of this crash. And federal investigators have arrived at the site as they try to piece together what caused the helicopter to go down near the city of Calabasas, just west of Los Angeles. Nick Watson, live in Calabasas, California, for us with the very latest on the investigation. Nick, let's start with the investigation. Where are we? Well, Asa, we are going to hear in about 45 minutes from the National Transportation Safety Board. They sent 18 people out here. They landed in California last night. They will have been at the site today. As uh, Cyril just mentioned, we know that three bodies have been recovered. There will then be the identification process. We were told by the coroner's office that could take a few days. Now, on the investigation, as I say, we'll hear some more soon, but what we know so far is that they will be obviously investigating the maintenance record of this helicopter. Now, I spoke earlier today 
to a pilot who used to fly that exact helicopter, flew Kobe Bryant in that exact helicopter, he says up to 100 times. And he said that the maintenance record on that aircraft was perfect, that the company that operated that aircraft had a very strict maintenance program. He also says it just has a great reputation. It's known here in L.A. as a kind of limousine of the skies that, you know, uh, the uh, well-heeled used to avoid Los Angeles traffic. So they will be looking into the background of the pilot of the aircraft, and also they will be looking into the weather. We know that that pilot had requested what is called special visual flight rules. That means he was flying without ideal visibility or lower than normal. That was granted to him by the tower. Beyond that, we don't really know much. We know he was flying too low, probably for radar. That was one of the last communications with the tower, but there was no distress call, no mayday put out. So investigators will usually put out some kind of preliminary report in 10 days. It could take a lot longer than that before we really find out what happened to the nine people on that helicopter who all perished when it hit that hillside just near the Pacific Ocean coast. Guys. Uh, Nick, all of, uh, all of LA basketball was scheduled to actually come together tomorrow, Tuesday, for a Lakers-Clippers game um, at Staples. And I just right. heard before the show, that's now being canceled. That has been postponed, Cyril. Yeah, they say out of respect for the Lakers organization, they are mourning. This, the whole of Los Angeles is mourning. This wasn't just a basketball player. This was a guy who was L.A. And, you know, I got a text message this morning from a friend of mine, a lifelong Angelino, a lifelong Lakers fan. And she said that what Kobe Bryant and those successful Lakers of his era managed to do was unite the city like no one else. She said she used to go to, uh, you know, the uh, sort of victory parades, she would go on her own because it didn't matter. There was a kinship amongst the fans. Kobe and the Lakers managed to unite the city, and this city is really grieving. He was a symbol because of his gratitude and the things that he'd done for children. He was a mentor. Nick, what there for us? Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, appreciate it. And I know Thanks. Cyril, but Cyril hey. and I were talking uh, yesterday via via WhatsApp, wasn't it, about this? Uh, clearly, you were very moved by it. Yeah, well, well, people who watch this show may have heard me say that I was a basketball fan. So when you grow up in the '90s as a basketball fan, you know Kobe was the best player after after Michael Jordan, mm. and so anybody who liked the sport just idolized him, as did I. And so those. You know, those, when you hear of people like that passing, that just hits you harder. And he was 41. And CNN had yeah. spoken to him 10 days ago. This feels, it is way, way, way too soon um, for him to have passed. But here we are. You grew up watching him, so, you know, hearing the news, I know it's tragic for, for anyone here. But I knew very little about Kobe other than he was an NBA player. Well, but when you if you look up, at look the pictures at the you see, that's, that's what he means to that city. And by the way, I misspoke when I was speaking with Nick. The Lakers-Clippers game, not cancelled, as I said, but postponed, as, as Nick said. We'll keep on top of this story for you. I'm going to take you to Brazil because authorities there say 44 people are dead after heavy rains called mudslides in the southeast. Thousands have been forced to leave their homes and 100 cities have declared an emergency in the state of Minas Gerais. The governor said the most severely affected people lived in what he called informal housing and suggested that the region needs a housing plan to curb fatalities during the rainy season. The Trump administration is set to unveil its long-awaited Middle East peace plan on Tuesday. And the U.S. president says he thinks the Palestinians will get on board, even though they're already rejecting it. The Israeli prime minister will be at Mr. Trump's side when the plan is revealed. Benjamin Netanyahu is visiting Washington, along with his rival in next month's elections, Benny Gantz. Oren Lieberman is covering the story. Since the beginning of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, the U.S. has been a key player. Whether it's George H.W. Bush during the first meetings in Madrid, or Bill Clinton on the lawn of the White House with the landmark Oslo Accords, the United States has often been at the center of the photos and the process. More than just an observer, the White House has in the past pressured, cajoled, pushed, and urged the sides to come to agreements. In the last 30 years, every American president has brought together the Israeli and Palestinian leaders in an attempt to end the conflict. Camp David, the Clinton parameters, Bush's roadmap to peace, negotiations in 2010 and 2013, 
progress, if any, was incremental. Now it's President Donald Trump's time to try. He's set to unveil his long-awaited, much-hyped deal of the century this week. Not to the Israelis and Palestinians, but to the Israelis and the Israelis. Palestinians have outright rejected any plan from the Trump administration and any process that doesn't include them. It cannot even be called the deal of the century. It is the fraud and the hoax of the century. This is the most unfair game we've ever witnessed in international relations. In Washington, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his rival, Benny Gantz, met Trump on Monday, calling this an historic opportunity. We are in the midst of very dramatic diplomatic events, but the climax is still ahead of us. This will be Gantz's first ever meeting with the American president in what he called a personal invitation. President, full and committed partner, I wish to say to him from this stage, Israel is forever thankful for the United States friendship, and the United States can always count on Israel partnership. But this isn't a straightforward trip for Gantz. The timing of the release has led many to believe this is another political gift from the White House to Netanyahu, their loudest international cheerleader. The 70-year-old Israeli leader is facing indictment during a tough re-election campaign. The release of the plan now looks like a lifeline thrown by the White House, one that also distracts from impeachment hearings in Washington. Netanyahu is expected to meet Trump a second time on Tuesday, the exact day Israel's parliament votes on whether to allow immunity hearings for Netanyahu to begin. Orrin Lieberman, CNN, Jerusalem. And still to come, a prosecutor talks about the Jeffrey Epstein.